I'm Julie. Um, I am an LCPC licensed <coughs> clinical professional counselor. I'm also the manager at Alluvian for all the other therapists um, that we have. So um, what we're talking about today is near and dear my heart because, um, you know, working and having a meaningful family life and having meaningful connection in the community, sometimes it's really hard to find that balance. And so um, coming off COVID, I'm seeing a mental health crisis in our community like we have never experienced before. Um, and, and so I'm so excited to talk to you guys. And so when I was approached, you know, they wanted me to talk about resiliency training. And I said, well, can I talk about something that really means a lot to me and it's basic neurobiology and what stress does to your brain and how to heal your brain when you're overly stressed. And they said, yeah, that sounds great. So it ties into resiliency, but I think if you understand basic neurobiology, it's going to help you. So I did um, print off a wonderful picture of your brain, um, but I'm actually going to use my fist because this is the easiest way for you guys to learn what we're going to talk about. So um, our brain is, you know, the component that runs everything in our life, right? Our brain at birth develops from the bottom up inside out. So you look at a newborn baby, they're kind of fascinating because it's the one thing that kind of isn't developed at birth. It needs input, right? So we know that a newborn baby, um, it takes 10 days for their sight to come into because they go from a totally black environment to suddenly stimulus, right? And you look at that baby and how its brain grows. It, and it develops from the bottom up inside out. And so um, learning about how that affects you as an adult, it takes, you know, most people it's 24 years before your brain is fully developed. Did you know that? That's why your insurance drops um, a lot because you become much less impulsive when you get a mature brain. <laughs> so I'm going to teach you the three basic components. So where my wrist is will be your brain stem, right? It goes into your spinal cord. That's the first part. It's breathing, blinking, hunger, sex. Yes. Um, those things are pretty much on automatic pilot, but we can control them somewhat, right? Like if you go swimming, you're going to control your, your breathing, right? If you have a little three-year-old, you're going to have a blinking contest, right? The upper part of our brain is where we love to be. This is our upper cortex. It's all of this. Three-fourths of your brain. Um, we love to be in our upper cortex. Long brain waves. Your heartbeat is slow. Your breathing is deep. This is where you are when you're counting. Right now, you're using your upper cortex if you're really listening to me and not worrying about your kid, not skipping high school, right? <laughs> um, it's where you do any logical calculations. It's where you were when you decided what to wear today on this cold fall morning. Upper cortex, right? We love to be there. But we have this really interesting part of our brain that's right in the middle. It's known as our limbic system, okay? And it's, you see that I have that drawing. All those little parts envelop our limbic system. Um, if you were to stick your thumb in the middle of your head, you'd hit it really tiny compared to all of this, just this really small part. We jokingly call that your lizard brain. That's all the brain an alligator has, right? What's interesting is we cannot be in our upper cortex and our limbic system at the same time. They function, function independently, right? So if you have strong emotion, and I'm going to talk about anxiety, because I think that's the one thing that as professionals, we don't really recognize or deal with, right? So if you get highly anxious, like this morning, I can't say I was having an anxiety attack, but I go into work, four of my employees have a crisis, we need to help them. I'm running around, I'm supposed to be here at 9.15, I'm late, right? I got anxious. <laughs> I wasn't sure where El Banco was because I last time I was here was a different restaurant. So, right, like I'm a little anxious. So my heart's beating fast. When you have really strong emotion, what happens is all the blood and oxygen in your upper cortex drains and you blow your brain. All your blood and oxygen goes to the brain. And it becomes very reactionary very instinctual. And we have three responses when we're there. We fight back, we flee, or we freeze, right? And it's not very productive, right? It gets you through in the short term, but you don't make really good decisions because your brain is about this long, 
really short. <laughs> your brain, your, your heart, I'm sorry, your brain should be short. Your heart is beating really fast. Your breathing is really shallow. And you're making really poor decisions, right? So fighting, what does that look like in the professional work, world? Necessarily not this fighting, right? But boy, have you ever been on the receiving end of someone who's giving you a piece of their mind and they say things that can't be taken back? When you can ruin some really good business relationships, right? Flee, what does that look? Avoiding your phone calls? Lying to cover up a mistake they made? Right? Freeze. Can't think. Why can't I think? I'm so dumb. I can't think right now. No, you're in freeze mode. You just want that storm to pass over you. You're getting really small. You're shrunken up and you can't think because your brain has frozen, keeping you still because you feel like you're under attack. Okay. And sometimes you do a really interesting combination of the two. Like, have you ever been on the receiving end of somebody and they're like bawling out, chewing you out, and giving you up forth, and then they won't talk to you and they avoid you? Right? Fight for flee. Right? Or are you the person that freezes and then you go home and you think of everything you should have said? <laughs> Freeze fight. Right? Interesting. And so it's really good. Like, you know, if a tornado is coming through, it's probably a good thing to flee and get to a basement. Right? But with business, it's not highly productive. Now you add another couple of issues on top of yourself neurobiologically and it starts to get pretty dicey pretty fast. When you go limbic, you get a dump of adrenaline and cortisol in the body. Okay? Adrenaline gives you the energy. So it gives you the effort to fight or to flee um, to get it done. Um, if you're a highly productive worker, you have a dump of adrenaline. You have enough anxiety to make yourself productive. So anxiety isn't a bad thing. I actually think it's one of the yeah. gifts that we have in part of our survival brain. I love that I'm just anxious enough that I'm highly productive, right? Sometimes it gives me an edge. I might not have ever gotten there if I wasn't a little anxious, right? Um, gets me up on time. I actually dressed up a little nicer for you guys. I thought I better look professional today, <laughs> right? Like all those things, those give us the energy to do what we need to do. However, if you're getting too much of a dump of adrenaline, um, you're exhausted, right? You barely get dinner on the table. You start doing a couple loads of laundry. You're trying to help your teenager with this algebra. You get to bed at 11 o'clock at night and you can't shut your brain off. You can't get to sleep. Or maybe you fall asleep and an hour later you wake up and you can't get back to sleep. That's because you have so much adrenaline dumping in your system during the day. That's your sympathetic nervous system. That's what gets you up and running. That your parasympathetic nervous system, the thing that helps you relax, feel good, get rest. It can't counteract all the dump of adrenaline. Then we have another little nasty hormone that happens when you go from upper cortex to limbic called cortisol. Ooh. It's an interesting hormone that we produce. It's our stress hormone. Long term, it causes heart attacks and strokes. Not a good thing, right? In the short term, what it does, it's like an acid that eats in our brain. Okay. Have you ever been so stressed out like Maybe someone had a really bad illness. Maybe you went through a really bad divorce. Um, we're considering if you were in trouble at a job and your boss and you just didn't get along and you were driving to work every day. And you would find your keys in the fridge and your milk on the counter. And someone would tell you an appointment time and you couldn't keep track of when you're supposed to be at that appointment. Cortisol at work. Cortisol is like an acid that eats at your brain. So the more stressed you are, the higher the more cortisol that you're dumping, it literally eats at your brain. So a lot of times we find this forgetfulness and some struggling with like staying in the moment on task. Okay. Long term, what can happen is it can actually lead to a depressive episode. Anxiety and depression are linked. Okay. Um, what we know, what our modern research is showing us is if you have high anxiety and you're dumping this adrenaline, dumping this cortisol, that acid starts to atrophy your brain. 
And unfortunately, it starts to shrink the parts of your brain that produce dopamine and serotonin. There are feel good neurotransmitters that give us that sense of calm. It's going to be okay. And so you're not producing that dopamine and serotonin. You feel more stressed because you don't know what's going on neurobiologically with you. I'm losing it. I'm dumb. Like we start beating ourselves up with some really negative self messages, right? We keep going and working harder because we think if I just work a little harder, I'm going to fix this. Guess what? It doesn't work. And pretty soon we have people in a full, full blown depressive episode. And because there's such a stigma to mental health, a lot of times they don't even get the help that they're doing. Here's an interesting statistic I just heard from one of the docs that I work with. She just took a course. And, you know, a lot of people that um, get like depression or anxiety meds. Most of them are like SSRIs. That's a really common that you go on. That will only help your mood 25% or less. You add a second kind of med, it goes down from there in effectiveness. Why? We have to heal ourselves. We have to start doing things to heal our own neurobiology. Slow the pace down and to strengthen your amygdala, which is part of your limbic system, and your parasympathetic nervous system, the thing that helps you. Okay. So it's interesting because um, some really basic things, and I think part of our mental health crisis is because we've been isolated for a very long time. So cortisol, that stress hormone, the acid that eats on our brain, eats on our brain right? Um, there's really nothing, there's not a medication that you can take to counteract that. There's only one hormone that you also produce naturally, and it's called oxytocin. Have you guys heard of oxytocin? Okay. It's our love neurobiological <laughs> chemical that we produce. Okay. So like for instance, when a mom gives birth to her baby, right? Um, tons of oxytocin is open so she can open that birth canal and give birth to that baby. That's why, and you know, having been a mom myself, you look at this cottage she's alien with a flat ear, and you're like, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and the nurse is like, let me have him and clean him up. <laughs> he's like an alien looking, right? And then all your friends come in and yeah, he's cute. And he's not, right? Like, he's just a bald alien. <laughs> um, but you're so flooded with oxytocin. What's interesting is um, family members create oxytocin because we touch each other all the time. So you know, the mom nurses and or feeds and holds that baby. The baby is producing oxytocin. It actually plumps the brain. Um, the worst thing that we can do is be isolated, right? Like if we have someone that's in combat and gets um, captured, how do we punish them and break them psychologically? We put them in a box alone. We isolate them. They can't hear anybody. They get their food tray put in, right? And then they come out and they're beaten physically, so their touch is harmful. And they're told, your country has abandoned you, your wife has left you, nobody cares if you're here. Can you imagine the stress of that and how much cortisol buildup you would have in your brain and what happens to those poor men or women, right? Horrible, horrible. I've had, I've had people who have been in isolation, isolation in jail, um, but, Think of one guy, big, like six foot five, 350 pounds. Like I would not want to meet him in an alley. Bawling in my chair, talking about he was in isolation in prison. Saw no one, talked to no one for nine months. Bawling, like, like in the corner, sobbing because of what isolation did to him. Okay. So what has happened to us with COVID? <laughs> right? What literally happens is we, we're created to be, I like to call it part of a tribe, right? We need people that have our back, understand us emotionally, really get us, right? Um, obviously, we have those people that are real intimate and know all our stuff, but I even have kind of a tribe at work, like my coworkers that kind of help me and that I go to when I'm having a tough day, right? And so we see this with little children too, we circle with them, you guys teach circle security, so you're familiar with this, right? So what happens is as an adult, I have my attachment figure. I'm going to say my husband, right? We've been together for three years. So, you know, we get up in the morning, we do our morning routine, we kiss each other goodbye, wish him a good day. I pet my gold, I might have hair on me from him. Um, love, 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 right? And I go to work and I do my work and it gets stressful. 
So I'm building up cortisol, right? Building up cortisol. I go home, I like to kiss my honey, hello. That dog gets on my lap when I'm petting my pet. He's producing oxytocin, I'm producing oxytocin. It's washing the cortisol out of my system because oxytocin is the counterpart that we produce. So like as a therapist, if I'm doing therapy with like, let's say I have a little nine-year-old and his parents are getting divorced and they're fighting and saying really bad things about each other to him. And I'm working on a really hard book about what does that feel like to be split between your parents, right? Two, in the words of one of my nine-year-olds, I don't like to be sad, Julie. <laughs> Nobody likes to be sad, but we have to be sad to be healthy, right? So we're doing our workbook and then I'm gonna be like, okay, good job, Tom. I'm gonna ruffle his hair. Why? I need to touch him professionally in an appropriate way so he gets that boost of oxytocin so he can keep doing that processing that's causing lots of cortisol, right? I might nudge him with my elbow. Great answer. Give me a fist bump, right? Really important. Therapy cuts actually work because oxytocin, right? There's been studies on university campuses. Um, you know, they have therapy pets that will go around the campus. And um, those campuses have less rates of pneumonia and the flu during finals week than the campuses that don't do that for their students. So I get a lot of people, well, I don't have a significant other. I don't get to have that nurture and touch. I don't have a healthy sex life. I'm sorry, that's a big part of being healthy too, right? Because when you have that wonderful loving experience, you produce them bucket load of oxytocin. It's a big part of our mental health, right? What do I do? Go get a manicure, right? Have a professional talk to you and like even men, like it feels good, right? Go and get a massage, a chair massage for what is it? I think like a dollar a minute for 15 minutes at a chair massage somewhere. Go get your hair cut or go get a wash and blow dry. Right, because they're touching. That's why. Have you ever noticed that you tell your hairdresser stuff you shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> why? She's touching you, right? And you produce all this oxytocin, and all of a sudden you're like, "Why didn't I say that to her? <laughs> <laughs> I should have said that." <laughs> right? Yeah, because you feel closer to her than you really are. All the hairdressers come in; they think they think I'm a therapist, right? <laughs> because they hear all the stuff that they're touching us, right? So really important throughout the day. Um, I, I would really encourage you, um, give each other handshakes. It's good for your mental health. Bring back non-creepy nurturing touch. In fact, with the study show, I just heard this, we were doing a training at Alluvian. And um, if you watch football teams, like I never got this, I was a basketball girl, right? But you look at the football huddle and they're all huddling together. And then they slap each other on each other and go. The teams that slap the most win most games. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I don't want to go where we shouldn't go. But you, you watch a Super Bowl, it's interesting to watch. The closer the game is, the more you see these guys. And I don't even think they realize what they're doing. Now, what happens is when you create oxytocin, you also create a connection. And our brains literally hook up. Something we've discovered about 10 years ago called mirror neurons. Okay, so the problem with mirror neurons is, let's say I had a really great day at work and I come home and my husband had a really bad day at work. He doesn't even have to say anything. Like I come home and he's limbic, right? I walk in the door do, 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 do. and we go, what, what's the matter? Because suddenly your heart's beating fast, your breathing is shallow, your brainwave has shortened up. You don't realize that you have this physical sensation, but you know that you know that something is wrong because your brain, right? Or have you ever had a really anxious day and trying to get out the door and you can't find your kid keys and your baby starts crying? They're anxious. They're not sad. Their heart is beating so fast and they don't understand what's going on with mommy and they don't have a way to express it other than crying, right? Be near. So think about what this does in a workplace. I, I mean, I experienced this when COVID happened, Alluvian went into FEMA mode because we're a federally qualified healthcare facility, right? And all the news was coming about that we were all going to die, right? <laughs> like within days and we're healthcare facility. And I would go to meetings and I would just have to do centering, grounding on the tissues and grounding stuff just to lower my heartbeat because I would go into these planning meetings and you could just feel we were all in crisis mode. And I'm like, we have to make some really important what kind of death decisions here as a healthcare organization. We need to be at the cortex, not the 
So add to this, how am I with time? Add to this some other things. Um, if you've had trauma in your life, you've been assaulted, you grew up in a home with alcoholic parents who fought a lot, you witnessed domestic violence, um, parents went to jail, any kind of trauma, a bad car accident. I've talked to people who were sick and their parents didn't come visit them in the hospital. So they were hospitalized around strangers showing up. That's trauma. The younger you are, the ego lizard brain, right? the harder it is to sometimes get yourself back in your upper cortex. The good news is we can heal our brains, no matter what our age. Our brains, they call it neurogenesis. We want to heal ourselves. We want to be better. So the first thing that we have to do is really strengthen that parasympathetic nervous system, right? Because if you just go here and you do it a lot, um, you don't even realize it. You're just blowing your lid all the time, right? Getting it back to here is what you have to work on. And it comes through meditative practices. There's no pill. I mean, it can help you a little bit, but really you have to do the work. The meditation sounds super ooey gooey, but there's some real practical ones that you can do all the time. So one of the ones that I use every day, I call meditative breathing. <laughs> so I want you to breathe in through your nose. Okay. And when you do that, I want you to imagine that calm, wonderful things are entering your body. What my visual looks like is warm liquid sunshine because I live in Montana and I don't get much sunshine. <laughs> it's warm, right? So it's like this warm, wonderful stuff and I can see it all entering. And when you exhale, you're gonna use a first lift. When I do that, I'm exhaling my stress and it's like dragon breath. Everything icky, all my worries, my fast heartbeat, all of that is like it. Optimum is only six breaths in one minute. That's where we like to get. Most of us as Americans cannot do that when we start this. Okay. Gives, do I have smokers or you don't raise your hand? I think what you're doing, you're actually doing meditative breathing. Because you're doing, <laughs> the purse lift is the most relaxing. We do it when we nurse, we do it when we smoke, we do it when we kiss. Most relaxing movement. That's why you see people blowing into a paper bag on some comedy movies, right? When you're smoking, you're doing that. You're doing this. You see how slow and it just slowed my heart rate down. I just felt, oh, that felt good, right? Nicotine is a stimulant. You're addicted to it, but that's not what's calming you. You're doing meditative breathing. So you believe I'm going to feel better. You take about two minutes to do slow breathing, and then you're like, okay, I can do this again. The problem is most of my people who try to quit smoking address the nicotine addiction, but they never take time to slow their heart rate down. So they go back to it because when they get stressed, they have to slow their heart rate down. Okay. So let's try it. Let's breathe in our calm. Exhale your stress. Breathe in your wisdom. Exhale your confusion. Breathe in your calm. Exhale your stress. Breathe in your wisdom. Exhale the confusion. Can you feel it? We just rocked our heart through this part. Can you feel like the third one? We slowed it down. Because we're mirroring our own. Red for a nap. If you get a little lightheaded, you're breathing in too quickly. So just try to slow that down. Which wisdom? Yes. <laughs> I like breathing in my wisdom because if you're anxious, you're not thinking clearly, right? So I like that visual for me to think. I can get back into my wise thought. Another really easy meditation practice is what we call five, four, three, two, one. That was a very important thing. Um, and it's using your five senses because a lot of meditation is really hard because, you know, your brain is always like a radio, it's always on in the background. So people get really confused and they're like, well, I tried to meditate. And then I started thinking about my grocery list. Everybody does that. 
So then you just have to be gracious to yourself and go, oh, yeah, I started thinking about my, I'm going to go back and see if I can do it five more seconds, right? And expand that amygdala. So the five, four, three, two, one meditation is, I'd like you to look around and in your head, you can't do this out loud, it'd be confusing. I want you to name in your head five things that you see. We're going to use sight first. So name five things that you see. Very good. Four. I want you to tell me four things that you can hear. Three. Take stock of your physical body and what are you feeling? This is the touch sensation. Hot, cold, out of the chair. What do the different body parts feel like? Name three things that you're feeling. Two things that you can smell. Last one, what can you taste? Okay, you just meditated for about two minutes. Why? Because you stopped the worry and you're forcing blood and oxygen into your upper cortex, right? If you were worrying and thinking about, can she just get done? I have to get back to work. <laughs> if you participated, you just forced blood up there, okay? Another really important thing for us is exercise. And I, I, I don't need you guys to go to the gym and like be exercise Nazis, right? Where you like are sweating. Just general movement. What we're recommending is most of us have desktops, right? I know for me, sometimes it can be really bad. I can sit for a couple, three hours and suddenly I'm like, oh, I can hardly stand and move. I'm so stiff because I've been working so hard. Really, about every half hour, just getting up and moving around a little bit and sitting down, that will get blood circulation. We get blood and oxygen when we circulate our blood, right? And it heals our brain. Um, going for a walk, 20 minutes is the ideal amount of time, right? If, if you're recovering from addiction, alcohol, drugs, that kind of thing, daily, 20 to 30 minutes of daily exercise to heal that dopamine receptor that you damage through the sleep really important so that's and it just has to be moderate movement like just go for a walk with your dog it doesn't have to be anything really big okay. um take time for meaningful connections i'm glad to see you guys here like here joining together as business people um make time for family if it's healthy family connections religious organizations are great for that um, friends you know we i talked to a lot of people and they just quit hanging out with their friends because of covid make time for those meaningful connections Pump yourself with oxytocin by being around people that you care engage in meaningful nurturing touch we kind of touched on that i want you to think about being proactive not reactive My first session of the day yesterday, someone called me up. <laughs> Couldn't help myself, right? Um, stepped away, did my breathing, grounded myself to get my heart rate slow because it affected me, right? Um, when you go limbic and you don't understand what's happening, you try to make decisions right then. I'm going to show that person and tell them what I think what they said to me, right? Proactive is you figure out where are you going and what do you want out of life? I want to continue making a difference in my community. I want meaningful connections with my family every day. I'm going to invest time and energy in a couple of really dear friends that I have. Those are my top three. So when somebody does something, I say, okay, what are my main goals in life? I just told you, but why not? Right? So how am I going to respond so I meet those goals? Right? I'm not going to play defense and respond to you and get off track because I know where I'm going and what I'm doing. And I can feel angry at you, 
but do so in the tone way. I talk with you because I've worked on my calming skills so much. I'm not going to let you cross my boundaries, but I don't have to scream and yell and swear at you and be aggressive. I'll be assertive. Right? Because you have to expand that amygdala. You can't, unless you practice your fire drills, you can't do that. Right? You have to practice it. On that note, before I forget, if you're going to practice these meditations, please do so when you're already calm. Mm -hmm. People, I tell them, and I'm like, it's like a fire drill. Like when you were a kid and you did a fire drill at school, you don't do a fire drill in the middle of fire. <laughs> right? The first day of school, we all have our cute clothes on, everybody likes each other, we still like our teacher, and you can do a fire drill, right? Um, true story when I was in high school, I went to Great Falls High in the 80s. Oh, now you know how old I am. <laughs> and we had a teacher, and he should have been retired. Wonderful man. I adored him. And he would let us burn cookie parties. And um, one day, and we had this, like, it was over the lunch hour. You know how you extend the lunch hours. And it was 20 below zero. It was a snowy, cold winter day. And the fire alarm went off. And our door was closed. We're like, please, please, please. Don't make us, we don't have our coats. We're having a cookie bear. Don't make us go. And he was tired. He didn't want to walk down all the flights of stairs at Great Falls High. So he's like, sure. So we keep our door closed. We're having music. 10 minutes later, he goes, I better check to see if anybody's missed us. Opens the door and smoke comes billowing in. There's a fire, a cotton cotton fire in a locker, like 10 feet down the hall. And I remember him saying, you guys know what to do. Line up against the blackboard. And here we are, sophomores in high school, right? We just do it. And he's like, you know what to do. No running, no pushing, we're okay. And it's interesting because we all walk down those slippery terrazzo floors at Great Falls High from the second floor. Just very moderate pace. Nobody ran, nobody pushed. And we got out on the front lawn just as the fire department was coming up. Right? Same thing for you when you're doing these meditative exercises. If you don't do it when you're already calm and you're only doing it when you're in a panic attack or really anxious or really angry, what we know from research is you're going into a strong emotion and you're trying not to feel it, your brain's going to go, oh, no, I'm going to make this worse for you, <laughs> right? But if you're doing it when you're calm, two weeks, three weeks, and then you go to use it when you're tired of stress, your brain's going to go, oh, this is what you do when you feel good. I'm going to slow our heart rate down because we're going to feel good. Okay. So you have to do the work. It doesn't work if you don't do it when you're already calm. I mean, it'll work this much, but we want it to work this much, right? So learn how to be proactive, work at not being reactive and expressing your emotions. Express your emotions. You have to deal with your feelings, right? We have six core feelings. Happy, curious, love those. Curious is really easy to feed. Anger, sad, shame, embarrassment, fear. Those ones nobody likes, right? One third of our emotions are positive. You are not going to be happy all the time, no matter what you see on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to feel your real feelings. I mean, that's what therapy is all about, right? Like if you have trauma and you don't like the sadness of having been in that fatal car wreck with your best friend, you have to feel it until you no longer have the physical reaction that goes with that memory because we have to process it into our upper cortex that gets locked in our limbic system, right? So feeling your feelings, like, you know, like how many funerals have you been to that everybody gets drunk off their bums, right? Because they don't want to feel sad. You have to feel sad. My favorite thing is when I grieve, I like to grieve in the shower because my husband gets so triggered when I'm sad. He wants to fix it. Sometimes he can't fix it when my son and daughter and grandbaby who passed away across the country. You can't fix that, right? So I say, okay, I'm gonna think about all the sad things when they leave, I'm gonna miss that birthday. And I cry and cry and cry. And then I get out of the shower, I put a cold wash cloth on my face. I would say, okay, I'm done for now. If I need to, I'll grieve in eight hours. What happens is I actually grieve. And then it doesn't pop out in the middle of the afternoon when I don't wanna talk about it and then there. When somebody asks, how are you dealing with your son? Right? You can manage this in a really effective way, but you have to do it. In America, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I love that. But really, we're not going to be happy 24-7. We have to get real with what's happening and what we're feeling. You have to find out how to make every day meaningful. Like, if you don't feel like your job has purpose, you're just paying a electric bill, 
you need to rethink it because you're producing a lot of cortisol and dumping a lot of the drugs. You have to know that there's a meaning to your life. And you have to kind of do some, what makes meaning in my life? Is it my job? Is it my family? Is it leisure activities? Is it going camping? Those kind of things. And then really take time to take care of yourself. It's the oxygen mask, right? Like, what do they tell you in the airplane? Put your mask on first, because if the person next to you passes out and you're trying to get them and you pass out, you're both dead. You get your self-care if you're doing these things. It's amazing the number of people you can help. Well, thank you for your time. I hope this was valuable. Well, thank you, Julie.